Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week, we are talking to renowned chef and author, Kenji Lopez-Alt, about his cooking journey, which started at one of those Mongolian grill restaurants where you fill up a bowl with like raw meat and vegetables and they grill it for you. These days, he's got a new book out, The Walk, Recipes and Techniques. And we're also going to quiz him, food god that he is, on real infomercials for weird kitchen gadgets. Then we're going to hear some stand-up from the very funny Sarah Schaefer, who is not only going to be doing stand-up, but is going to teach the rest of us non-comedians how to do comedy. And finally, we're going to wrap things up with a musical performance from one of my daughter's favorite indie rock bands, and also mine. Can I get some cool points, please? Dead is their name, but their music is anything but. So that's the plan. Don't go anywhere. Livewire gets started right after this. They say the only constant in life is change, which is true, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the changes in our lives. A slight change of plans from Pushkin Industries is here to help. It's hosted by Dr. Maya Shunker, a cognitive scientist who is an expert on human behavior, and it's a show all about who we are and who we become in the face of big change. A Slight Change of Plans features incredible stories of transformation from guests like Ruby Bridges, who at six years old became a civil rights icon, and Christy Warren, first responder, who after enduring psychological trauma from helping others in emergencies, bravely sought out help for herself. Blending science with storytelling, a slight change of plans will leave you thinking differently about change in your own life. Listen to A Slight Change of Plans wherever you get your podcasts. Livewire is brought to you by Progressive, where customers who save by switching their home and car save nearly $800 on average. Quote at Progressive.com, Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going well. I see you're flying your Pittsburgh Steelers terrible towel in your studio today. I'm in my my work office, and I have my terrible towel so that I appear like a grounded human. Uh Uh-huh. Sure. Um, but nobody here is a Steelers fan, so... And also, nobody tell Elena that they are not in the playoffs this year, but that's okay. In my heart, they are. There you go. <laughs> hey, you ready to do the uh, station location identification examination? Oh, yeah, sure. I hope it's Pittsburgh. Oh, I mean, that accent actually sort of sounded a little bit like where we're talking about. This is the part of the show where I quiz Elena on a radio station that Livewire is on in the country. She's got to guess where I'm talking about. At one point, this city held the Guinness World Record for most bars and nightclub on one street. Green Bay, Wisconsin. You're in the right state. You can see the Mississippi River, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin from the legendary Granddad Bluff in this city. La Crosse, Wisconsin. Elena Passarello, you are a marvel. It is exactly La Crosse, Wisconsin, where we're on the air on WLSU Radio. I had another hint that I think would have been a dead giveaway because you're such a uh, bird enthusiast. Is that a, what do they call that, ornithophile or something? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, known as the bird watcher's paradise because you can find bald eagles, tundra swans, great egrets, bluebirds, warblers, and sparrows. Oh, I love all those. Yeah, sounds like your kind of town. Shout out to everyone listening at WLSU in La Crosse. All right, should we get to the show? Let's do it. Take it away. From PRX, it's... This week, chef and author Kenji Lopez-Alt. That's like one of my favorite infomercial lines ever. (laughs) Stop having a boring tuna, stop having a boring life. (laughs) And comedian Sarah Schaefer. Do you know how hard it is to build a dollhouse without being able to shop at Hobby Lobby on principle? These people played a direct role in taking away our bodily autonomy, but they have such an incredible selection of clues. My God! With music from Dead and our fabulous house band, I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now the host of Livewire, Lou Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. 
Thanks to everyone for tuning in from all over the country, including beautiful La Crosse, Wisconsin, folks on WLSU. We've got a great show in store for you this week. We have a listener question. We asked the LiveWire listeners, what is your most ambitious DIY project? We're going to hear those responses coming up in a few minutes. First, though, of course, we got to kick things off with the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder at the top of the show that there is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news you heard this week? Okay, so this is one of those best newses that starts out really not best. Okay. Sounds kind of worst, but it gets better. Okay. It's like the internet video where they say, wait for it. Okay, we're waiting yes, for it to wait get for best it. news. Right. So there is a plant disease that is ravaging the olive trees of Italy. Oh, no. It's not that great. Uh, It's called Zayella, and uh, it's really affecting the region of Puglia in Italy, where 50% of Italy's olive oil is produced. Oh, no. It's attacking trees that are like hundreds of years old, and it's a a relatively new disease to Italy, but it's actually happened all over the world, including to certain vineyards in California. It's just this, this, this bacteria or disease or something that kind of suffocates the plants. And it's spread by hungry spittle bugs. And they bite one plant and they get their spit in there and then they take it to another plant and they bite that plant. And it's just awful. It's spreading through Italy at like 12 miles a year. And you control it by uprooting the plants entirely. But the problem is humans have a really hard time detecting if a plant has this disease Mm. at its early stages. So a couple of years ago, there's a guy who's an olive manufacturer who used to be an Italian policeman where he worked with drug-sniffing dogs. Okay. This guy's name is Nicola Di Nola. And so then he called basically the Italian version of the American Kennel Club. So he's like, which breeds would be best for being trained to detect this scent of this disease? And they were like, Springer Spaniel, Cocker Spaniel, Lab. So I read this amazing article in the BBC about this adorable lab named Paco who is now able to detect. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. If you're a human, it is completely not detectable to you. But Paco and other dogs like Paco are learning how to uh, monitor all of the crops of Italy. So basically, I can get my olive oil and bread dip whenever I need it, which is really the most important news for me. That was exactly where my brain went, the Evo. If I don't have my Evo, if I don't have my extra virgin olive oil, I'm in a lot of trouble. So I'm glad to hear that. I get evil if I don't get my Evo. So thank you, Paco. Mille grazie, Paco. (laughs) <laughs> I've also got an animal story that I saw this week. I want to mention that our executive producer, Laura Haddon, specifically asked that I do this story. So if this gets us banned from public radio, I was only following direction here. It's the story of a raccoon in Cochrane, Georgia. Now, you've spent some time in Georgia. Have you ever been through Cochrane? Oh, yeah, my old stumps. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Well, apparently it can get cold in Cochrane. It was about 10 degrees recently, and a railroad worker named Neil Mullis was out checking on the railroad tracks, and what did he find but a raccoon who had been wandering across the tracks and decided to sit on the railroad tracks and became attached to the tracks via his anatomy. His anatomy. The raccoon's anatomy froze to the railroad tracks. There are, there's video and pictures of this. And it, it would be adorable if it weren't so scary for this raccoon who's just sitting there. Like, remember the old black and white movies where the, you know, like the, the villain would tie the damsel up to the, to the railroad tracks? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what this raccoon had like wandered into, but the like, uh, you know, Christmas story version where it's frozen to the tracks. It's his, his like bathing suit parts is exactly. what you're saying. That's right. Okay. That's the part of the okay. raccoon that got stuck to the tracks. Thank <laughs> goodness Neil Mullis and uh, his uh, coworker saw this raccoon and embarked on a project to get the raccoon off of the tracks, which involved pouring warm water on the raccoon's bathing suit area and slowly <laughs> using a shovel to, to lift the <laughs> raccoon off of the tracks. And uh, it, I mean, this raccoon was really stuck. There was fur from the raccoon still on the tracks. This is cell phone uh, footage from Neil's cell phone. Again, we're going to have to bleep some of this out later, but this is what a Georgia railroad employee sounds like when they found a raccoon that is 
stuck to the train tracks by way of its nether regions. Operation well performed. Little fella's safe. There's the rest of his nut hair. God damn nuts froze to the rail. That that's the only place on public radio you're gonna hear that tape this week, my friends. So it's like a like a raccoon Brazilian bikini wax That's via right. the train tracks. Sure, some people pay extra for that, but this raccoon got a free one. Uh, the raccoon uh, was just fine, ran off into the woods. Um, did you know this? I didn't realize male raccoons are called boars. I didn't know that. B-O-A-R-S. This was an article I saw in the uh, Daily Mail, and this is how you know it was a hit story, Elena. It says, we are no longer accepting comments on this article. There were so many comments. <laughs> Or maybe so many inappropriate comments, they had to shut it down. (laughs) So uh, that raccoon getting a free Brazilian is the best news that I heard this week. Let's welcome our first guest on over to the show. He's a chef and wildly popular New York Times food columnist. He's also the best-selling author of The Food Lab and the host of the YouTube series, Kenji's Cooking Show, which has over a million subscribers. His latest cookbook, The Walk, Recipes and Techniques, is available now. Take a listen to this. It's our conversation recorded at Town Hall in Seattle with Kenji Lopez-Alt here on LiveWire. Hi. Kenji, (laughs) welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, you're one of those classic chefs that studied architecture at MIT. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when did you actually get into food? So I started getting into food um, the, the summer after my sophomore year of college when I was quitting biology because uh, I took organic chemistry and I hated that. Yep. Uh, so th- that summer I was, I was going through this, you know, what am I going to do with my career? Uh, and so I, I needed to make money. So I was looking for a job as a server uh, and then a restaurant I walked into was like, uh, well, we, we have a prep cook who didn't show up this morning, so if you can start today, you can have a job as a cook for the summer. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. Uh, and do that's when I started cooking. Do you remember what you were doing in oh, those yeah. first days in the kitchen? Yeah, I remember the, my very first day when I, um, I... So the question they asked me was, do you know how to hold a knife? And I said, yes, but I didn't really. Um, and I was, I was slicing oranges for the bar, and the, one of the prep cooks comes over to me and like, like just like stands there shaking his head. <laughs> And so he showed me how to hold a knife properly and how to slice an orange, and I had to practice on a lot of oranges. Yeah, it was it was at it was at like a it was at a all you can eat Mongolian grill type oh, place. Yeah. And, Is that the kind with yeah. the big the big grill where you bring the bowl of your stuff and exactly. they just yeah, put yeah, it on yeah, a yeah. section of yeah, the grill? It's like pre pre COVID days. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you <laughs> oh, yeah. go to you go to the raw meat bar where everyone's like poking around. Oh yeah. oh yeah. And then um, I started as a prep cook, and within two weeks I was a knight of the round grill. So. Whoa, wow. and that was your title. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after, after working in restaurants, that's when I started to sort of get into eating food. And I was like, oh, this is like interesting. Be- before that, I was a pretty picky eater, um, especially like going out at restaurants. I didn't want anything interesting. Um, and so I started learning how to cook. And then I was like, oh, this is a whole new world of stuff to appreciate. And then got into food after that. Your grandfather was a chemist? Organic chemist. Yeah. Now, do you feel... Do you feel... Uh, do you feel like that sort of in your DNA that you were programmed to want to really get into food on a, a more kind of molecular and scientific level? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think um, interest in science is like no. genetically passed that's down. Epi- that's not epiphenomenal. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, um, but certainly like my, my grandfather was a chemist and my dad was a biologist. And so there's a lot of sort of science conversation at, at the dinner table. So, um, so in that sense, yeah, I think it definitely got passed down to some degree. Your first cookbook was this huge hit. What do you uh, attribute that to? Was it just that you were able to help people understand how to make some relatively simple stuff just a lot better using science? No, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it is like being in the right place at the right time, just like being really lucky. Uh, when I started cooking, um, there wasn't really, I mean, there was an internet, but there wasn't even like YouTube, anything like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, and so I, I learned how to cook in restaurants and then, and then I went into the writing world and then I kind of, I kind of came along the writing world uh, and, and my, my career as a writer kind of paralleled uh, the shift from paper to online media um, and got really lucky to um, fall into like, that those early sets of like sort of food blogs that became popular and finding a platform on serious eats. 
you know, the, the, as far as the book goes, the way I thought about it was that, you know, I didn't come into cooking until much later in my life compared to a lot of chefs I know, you know, who like maybe they had parents who cooked or they have the food of their people. And, you know, it's like I didn't come into food that way. I came into it as like a summer job uh, and then I wanted to learn about it. You know, so for me as a cook in restaurants, like I, I did have a lot of questions about like why things worked the way they did and whether I could make my life easier by if I did it a slightly different way. You know, so when I wrote that first book, I was kind of thinking, yeah, if somebody wrote a book for me when I was 19 or whatever and wanted to, like, not waste so much time um, <laughs> poorly peeling boiled eggs, uh, what, what would that book look like? And so that's, that's what that first book kind of was. What's the key to effectively peeling boiled eggs? You, you start them in hot water. So, like, it's, that's Science. Like, yeah, I mean, like thousands of eggs worth of, of testing on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first on Livewire. <laughs> okay, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, though, I want to ask how um, uh, an infomercial uh, may have led directly or indirectly sure. to this latest yeah. book of yours. We're talking to Kenji Lopez Alt here on Livewire. Back with much more in a moment. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to Livewire from Town Hall in Seattle. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We're talking to Kenji Lopez Alt, the uh, food writer and YouTube host, about his latest book. It's uh, called The Walk Recipes and Techniques. Um, now, is it true that your interest in the walk really came from seeing an infomercial about <laughs> kitchen gadgets or something? Uh, it was an infomercial about walks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Specifically walks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what were they doing on there that, that you found compelling? <laughs> uh, well, it was, a, it was like a very British guy um, uh, calling it the Great Walk of China. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Casually uh, well, racist. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and a lot of steaming when there was supposed to be stir-frying going. Um, <laughs> but um, the selling point of this walk was that it was like hand-hammered and they showed this footage of like, of like where they were, where where the people were making the walks in the in in these factories, and they're like hammering them into tree stumps to mold them, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But anyhow, uh, I I I watched a lot of infomercials as a kid, um, and, and that one always kind of st stuck out to me as like, oh, we actually have this one in our kitchen. <laughs> when in your cooking life, once you you know realize this is what you wanted to do, and you're starting to really look into food and write about food, did you start to use a walk more? The walk was one of the few things that my, you know, my mom cooked a lot of, she came here from Japan. She cooked a lot of Japanese and, and sort of uh, Sino-Japanese food in um, a walk. Uh, so, you know, so I was familiar with the tool and particularly like deep frying shells did that in a walk. So I was familiar with the tool growing up. Um, but I, you know, I bought myself a walk when I was in college. So um, like right after I started cooking. Um, so I, I bought it, uh, yeah, I bought it at a Target in Somerville <laughs> um, for 20 bucks. And that same walk um, up until... This book was published in March, and that walk was like fully functional until like April or so. Wow. The so one you so, bought at Target, yeah, Target twenty years. So, I mean, because I, I cooked for you know, it's like I cooked in college. I cooked um, like when I was after college, living with roommates, and you know, like when it was just me and my wife, and um, and now my family. So you know, so it's like a tool that honestly is like spent has spent like every every stove I've ever had like at least sixty percent of the time like there's that walk was sitting on it. Wow. You know, um, uh, so it's a. Uh, it's a tool that, you know, like this entire book, there's only like one or two recipes that call for anything other than just a walk on a stovetop. Um, and so, you know, whether you're learning how to cook or whether you're, you're trying to learn a new style of cooking or familiarize yourself with a very ancient and um, well-researched style of cooking, it's, it's, it's a cheap investment. I, like a lot of folks, bought a walk at some point, mm -hmm. tried it a few times. It never 
gave me, or I never got the effect I was going for. Didn't taste like the stuff I had been eating in a restaurant that was cooked in a wok. Right. What are people like me probably doing kind of wrong in that scenario? Well, so a couple things. Um, the, you know, the first one is that... Um, <laughs> like, how much more time in the show do we have for me to list the ways you're bad at this, Burbank? No, no, so the first one I think is that, is that you're... Um, you're trying to you're trying to get exactly what you get at a restaurant, you know, which is it's it's a goal it's, it's an achievable goal, um, but it's not necessarily I think the first goal you should have with the wok, you know, um, and particularly like ones that have like a lot of like wok hey like the the smoky like getting the flame in there like that's a, that's a technique that takes some practice and also some specialized equipment to do at a restaurant scale, um, and you know, and then that said. In the book, I talk about a few ways you can try and get some of those restaurant flavors. Um, so in particular, like a lot of it comes down to cooking in smaller batches. Mm. Um, and um, instead of trying to do what they do on the infomercial, like where you just right. add like t- tons and tons of stuff until it's like all the way right. at the top and just steam. That was literally exactly what I did. <laughs> I probably bought, you know, like $40 worth of like vegetables, meats and everything. And it was like it was for an army. And yeah, I'm just yeah. like, ah, <laughs> my, my bird like arms can't even like toss this thing <laughs> on my dorm stove. <laughs> Uh, we're talking to Kenji Lopez Alt about uh, his latest book, The Walk Recipes and Techniques. Okay, now as you mentioned in the book, and as we've been talking about, your kind of first little bit of interest in the walk was from an infomercial mm-hmm. advertising it, um, and so we wanted to test your knowledge of some other infomercials okay. about culinary contraptions. Okay. This is a game we're calling Inspect Your Gadgets. Okay. Yeah. Inspect your gadgets. <laughs> All right. Um, the Live Wire house band, by the way. Now, uh, here's how this is going to work, Kenji. Uh, okay. I'm going to play you a snippet of an actual infomercial. Okay. And all you right. have to and try to. They're all food to, related. These are all, yeah, these, okay. are, these are infomercials yeah. for, for like food based items. Okay. Okay, things in the kitchen. Okay, so here's the first one. What do you think this is an infomercial for real food thing? I used to use a fork. Get the fork out of here. Now you just grip it, dip it, flip it. And the best part is your fingers stay clean. Um, jeez. Is that, um, I don't know. Is, is, it, is it for like, a sh- like, like shredding barbecue claws? You know, the, this would work with that. This is for a product, a real thing called trongs. Oh, okay. Trongs are these little... Like, you know those, like, um, wax, like, vampire teeth you mm. get when you're a kid, like, you know, for mm-hmm. Halloween? They're like that, but you put them on your fingers, yeah. and they're made of, like, food-safe, oh, like, right. plastic, and when you're eating hot wings or something, the juice doesn't get on your actual <laughs> fingers, it gets on the trongs. Okay. And the, if you watch the full ad, the guy literally says, have you ever been eating wings, and then you realize you can't shake anyone's hand. Yeah. Aww. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a product that was created when a person realized that he couldn't shake enough hands immediately after eating wings. Right, because, because when, you, when you see the guy eating wings with yeah. trongs on their fingers, you, don't, you, you yeah. don't go close enough to shake their hands. Right, exactly. <laughs> it solves the problem, but not in the intended way. Right. All right, trongs were the most obscure. Okay? okay, that was the hardest one probably. Okay. So this one was a little more widely embraced. This is another actual uh, snippet of an infomercial for a food product. This thing, this tuna, looks boring. Stop Ooh, yeah. having a boring tuna. Stop, Stop having, having a boring, a boring life. life. <laughs> Add this tuna, put it here like this. Whoa. Now you're going to have you're gonna a love nice my nuts. tuna hey. salad. Look at this. You're going to have an exciting life now. Who is that? This and is what the is... Slap Chop. It is absolutely the Slap Chop. <laughs> that's, not, that's like one of my favorite infomercial lines ever. <laughs> Stop having a boring tuna. Stop having a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that I'm is, of so course, impressed. that's Vince, right? Yeah, that he guy went, was went to jail rude. for biting someone, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's no, right. In, in fairness, he he grabbed them with his trunks. Uh, <laughs> was actually later the court he was fine. You should have slap chopped them. Yeah. Yeah. That. That, that that whole ad is like riddled with entendre, like you said, Kenji. Like he's like chopping up nuts, and he's like, "You're gonna like my nuts." <laughs> yep. He was like the bad boy of infomercials, Vince. I bought a slap chop. Yeah, how'd it work? Terribly. <laughs> the problem was, so if, if you weren't familiar... Life is it, still boring. Right? It was kind of, 
The tuna was the least of my problems. <laughs> it, it was this, it was like a, a kind of a plunger thing that had a, a knife on the bottom that was kind of S-shaped, mm -hmm. and it had a, a, a kind of a, a plastic cylinder around it, and the idea was you'd put it over your thing of onions, and you just slap it down, and it would just like chop the onions, and you wouldn't cry. The problem was the thickness of the blade. Yeah. It was not a blade. It was a flat piece of metal that was like a quarter inch <laughs> mm -hmm. thick. So it just would mash. I mean, it made the tuna more boring. Yeah. <laughs> Impossibly. But it's the only one of those things I've ever purchased because the ads were that convincing mm. to me. I thought it was really going to change my life. Okay. Here comes another one. Can you identify this? Are you tired of fussing with giant pasta pots, strainers, timers, stirring, and testing just for a plate of pasta? Well, I've got the solution for you. Hi. I'm Kathy Buddy. I have to finish that line because she was the lady doing all of the infomercials for a while. <laughs> Kathy Buddy. Hmm. <laughs> Is it a, um, a spaghetti-shaped thermometer that you throw at the ceiling? Wow. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> That is a million dollar idea. Yeah. Yeah. That is not what this is, but that, my friend, is a million. This is why you have 500,000 Instagram followers. No, yeah. it is a pasta boat. Okay. It was a boat shaped thing that you would put pasta in and water and then put it in the microwave. Oh, geez. And microwave all of your pasta. Nice. I think David Chang sells that now. Yeah. Isn't that just a bowl? Like <laughs> no, Elena. Bowls are cumbersome and they fall out of the cupboard on you. <laughs> As for some reason, the screen turns to black and white for that section. Like, the easiest thing that we've all been doing, but now if you just film it right, it looks like it's the bane of everyone's yeah. existence. Black um, and white. Have you black ever bought a, like, one of these extremely kind of silly kitchen gadgets? You know, I was just remembering like a month ago of a time when we tested a bunch of like the most ridiculous uh, hamburger products you could find. <laughs> So there's one called the hot dogger where you where it's like a hot dog shaped mold so you can put hamburger into it and shape it like a hot dog. And it's like if, if you run out of hamburger buns but you still have hot dog buns. Um, Honestly, that's a good idea. Uh, Kenji Lopez Alt, the new book is The Walk: Recipes and Techniques. Thanks for coming on Livewire. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That was. Kenji Lopez Alt, right here on Livewire, recorded at Town Hall in Seattle. His latest book is The Walk Recipes and Techniques. Hey, special thanks this week to Chris Bright of Portland, Oregon. Chris is part of the Livewire member community and is generously supporting our program with a donation each month, which we are extremely appreciative of because it's how we're able to do this show each week. So a huge thanks to Chris Bright for keeping Livewire going. This is Livewire. Of course, each week we ask our Livewire listeners a question in honor of uh, Kenji and our upcoming guest, Sarah Schaefer's extreme DIY abilities. We asked our listeners, tell us about your most ambitious DIY project. Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? <laughs> How about this one from Brian? Brian says, I have never built anything before, and I built a two-level chicken coop that could be open from the outside, and you could pull out the eggs. It is the one and only time I have used the Pythagorean theorem as an adult. <laughs> wow. And that worked. And by the way... Brian is laughing all the way to the bank. Have you seen how expensive eggs are right now? That's right. Yeah, no, like that Pythagorean theorem really yeah. paid off in terms of this avian flu egg shortage, huh? I was too busy investing in crypto, and my friends that were building chicken coops knew where the real money was. Uh, what's another DIY project that one of our listeners took on? Sort of a different topic from Claire. Claire's biggest DIY project, having children and trying to make them into decent people. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, you never stop Ding that IY. I know as a parent of someone in their 20s, it is a lifelong journey. Doesn't it just turn into DIT? Like they got to do it themselves or well, no? Well, ideally, Elena, ideally. <laughs> um, what's one more before we move on? Speaking of parents, what do you think about this one from Lynn? Lynn's most ambitious DIY project, helping my daughter photograph the undead. Photograph the undead, i.e. ghosts, I guess, right? Yeah. Wow. Is it a science project at a, at a very liberal school in terms of what science is? Uh, 
I watch all of those shows where they're like ghost hunting, and I really want there to be ghosts. I want them to have some evidence, but it's always just kind of like a little blip on the audio recorder and everybody kind of freaks out. I'm very happy to not hunt or photograph or, in, I mean, they may be out there, but you know what? I'm not going to look. <laughs> I'm fine on my own. <laughs> you know, let those sleeping ghosts lie is kind of your policy. Amen to that. Yes. All right. Thank you to everyone who sent in those responses uh, to our listener question this week. Let's welcome our next guest on over to the show. Sarah Schaefer is a critically acclaimed comedian, writer, and producer. She was the co-host of MTV's late night show, Nikki and Sarah Live. She won two Emmys for her work at Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. And she joined us on stage at Revolution Hall in Portland recently. And just a quick note before we get to this performance, it is a little visual in some instances, particularly a puppet makes an appearance. You remember that, Elena? Oh, yeah. I can't forget that puppet. <laughs> a, our technical director, Molly Pettit, uh, brought a puppet out on stage. I don't want to say anything more. I don't want to ruin it for you. So just take a listen to this. It's Sarah Schaefer here on LiveWire. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. So good to be here. Um, I have to set this up. I'm, 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 I'm doing a solo show um, for you tonight. It's about 90 minutes. No, um, no I'm, I'm working on this solo show. It's called Going Up. And the premise of the show is it's a, a fake seminar about how to make it in comedy. And I'd like to do a little portion of it for you tonight, if that's okay with you. Okay. Because I can feel it. There's a lot of people in this room that are lost. And you're looking for purpose. That purpose? Comedy. But Sarah, I already have a career. I'm a dental hygienist. You were a dental hygienist. Your new life has now begun. So if you're going to make it in comedy, pretty early on, you're going to want to decide on your brand. What type of comedian are you going to be? Now, there's lots of different styles of comedy to choose from, and I'm going to demonstrate them for you right now by telling a joke in each style along one specific topic. Quick note about topics. Now, when you're working on something creative, maybe you've heard the phrase, write what you know. Write what you know. Well, in Comediosity, we take it a step further. Not only do we write what we know, we write what everybody else knows. We pick those big, broad topics that everybody can relate to. Food, family, relationships, the differences between men and women along a cis-heteronormative binary, right? So you're going to want to pick a very big, broad topic. For this demonstration, I'm going to pick a topic that not only do I know, but that everyone else knows, and that is miniatures and dollhouses. Here we go. <laughs> First up, standard comedian. You've seen a few. Here's a standard comedian, standard joke. I love miniatures and dollhouses, um, and I know you might look at me and not immediately think that. You might, you know, because normally we associate dollhouses and miniatures with like grandmas and ghosts, right? <laughs> but I do have the muscle tone and overall demeanor of a grandma, and I am dead. I actually, <laughs> I have been dead ever since Beyonce played Coachella. I died. I literally died. So that's like a standard joke, right? So. And then we have your one-liner, one-liner comic. Man, miniatures, I love a tiny thing. But my husband asked me to stop calling it that, see? That's a one-liner. Then we have the misdirection comic. Now, you might not have heard that term before, misdirection. Uh, but once I demonstrate it for you, you'll, you'll get it. Here's a misdirection comic. Um, and this is actually true. I, I am officially a first-time homeowner. <laughs> Thank you. It's a dollhouse, anyway. I have very little money. I keep it in a matchbox. It's adorable. And you just keep going. Never finish the sentence. Just keep changing directions. That's misdirection. You know, you know what I'm talking about now. You're starting to get it. And we have Storyteller. Here's a quick story. I was recently shopping for miniature supplies at my, one of my favorite places to shop, Joann's. If you've been to Joann's, you know about Joann's, right? We got a few, jo come on. NPR crowd, come on. <laughs> We're spending hours in Joann's. Joann's is a great store for crafting supplies. It's where you can shop for crafting stuff right alongside other women literally named Joann. <laughs> and 
Joannes are kind of like Karens, right? Except instead of being motivated by racism, they're motivated by coupons. Very fine line. Very fine line. <laughs> Now, whenever I go to Joannes, it's always the same thing, right? You know, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. It's a long line, and one register is open, and it's always being held up by one Joanne. She's up at the front, and for some reason, she's not done shopping yet. She's running back into the aisles to get more stuff. And if you know, if you shop there a lot, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing a full half hour of jokes on Joanne's right now. <laughs> Joanne's, if you know, if you shop there, you know what's going on. She was trying to use the coupon, the one, the main one we all love. Spend thirty-five dollars, get five dollars off. Great value. But she gets up to the front, and she didn't meet the threshold. She didn't get out the calculator. She didn't realize the sales, and now she's screwed. So she's running back in the aisles to get more stuff to try to get over the line. But that's not what we agreed to. We made a silent agreement. You get up to the front, and if you don't get over the line, you got two choices: you abort the mission, or you're grabbing whatever's in arm's reach to get over the line. You're buying three bottles of blueberry muffin hand soap. Or those are your only two options, right? So that's a story. <laughs> Um, and then we have poignant solo show comic. Solo show comic. They'll tell that same story, but at the very end, they'll add one really harrowing, messed up detail from their life. <laughs> Whatever the worst thing that's ever happened to you, use it. Mine your trauma. Add it on it. Just tack it on at the end, and do the whole story with new meaning. <laughs> so, for instance, you tell that same whole story, and at the end. You say something like, "And that's when I was attacked by my seasonal allergies. Blackout, standing ovation, critical acclaim, Netflix special, Emmy awards." Then you have your crowd work comic. <laughs> Who's out there? You two, you two together. <laughs> Answer me, you two. <laughs> no, yes, you're the miniaturist of the household. <laughs> It's you, her mom. her mom. Oh wow, are you gonna let him talk to you that way? <laughs> What scale are you working in? <laughs> What scale are you working in? <laughs> I'm not gonna leave until you answer me. Tenth of an inch. Wow, bold. I'm more of a one twelfth or myself. What's your favorite fraction? See, this is when you just become best friends with one lady in the audience. Personally, I'm a three eighths girl myself. When you do crowd work, you really want to listen. You know, don't just force your stuff onto them. <laughs> And we have. Political comedian. Only 20 more examples. Hold on. <laughs> Political comedian. You know how hard it is to be a miniaturist and a feminist at the same time. Why? Two words: hobby, lobby. Ah! Do you know how hard it is to build a dollhouse without being able to shop at Hobby Lobby on principle? These people played a direct role in taking away our bodily autonomy, but they have such an incredible selection of clues. My God! <laughs> but you know what? Maybe I wouldn't even have to be shopping at Hobby Lobby because maybe if I could afford a real-sized house, I wouldn't have to build a dollhouse. But I can't because malignant capitalism has decimated the housing market. Am I right? <laughs> Clap. All right. See now that's called that's something called clapter. That's when you fill the air with clapping instead of laughter by just saying something that you think the audience will agree with. Now, some people think that's a political thing. They think that's woke comics only use clapter, and they think it's a brand of comedy. But no, it's just a tool that all types of comedians use. And in fact, I would say that the type of comedian that makes fun of woke comedy, the type of comedian that makes fun of clapter, is kind of the one that uses it the most. And that, of course, is the Edge Lord, which I will now demonstrate for you. <laughs> the Edge Lord. Oh, my son came up to me the other day. 
He was like, Daddy, Daddy, I want a dollhouse. And I was like, no. What are you, a f***ing snowflake? Oh, can't say that anymore, can I? What are you going to do, cancel me? Obviously. But you know what? I'm just saying what everybody's thinking. I hate my son. Clap, clap. All right, there you go. And we have the beloved puppet comic. For those listening at home, I have a puppet of myself. <laughs> For some reason. Oh, hey, Jessica, what are you doing today? Oh, you know, I'm just playing with my miniatures. Wait a minute. Why are you talking like that? No, that's how I talk. Why? That's just how I... But, well, no, I don't think we should do that accent. <laughs> Why not? Because it's just, I don't know how, it's just, it's, I feel like it's going to get racist. I don't think I should do that. No, 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 no. No, Sarita. Let's <laughs> see, it's not racist. Because you're not saying it. <laughs> I'm saying it. No! Get away from me. And then finally, we have, uh, there are many other examples. Uh, hopefully, I'll be doing my show for you in Portland next year, so look for it. <laughs> finally, uh, we have musical comedian. We didn't do a sound check, so it's their fault. All right. I love miniatures, yes, I do. They are so tiny and so cute. But I think the real reason I love them is cause I'm in charge now, I'm in charge now. They're so little and I'm so big. They're so tiny, I could f***ing crush them. That's musical comics. So you're gonna wanna choose one of those. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Sarah Schaefer, everyone. That was Sarah Schaefer right here on Livewire, performing at Revolution Hall in Portland. Uh, the show going up that that was part of, that we just heard from Sarah, is actually visiting various cities around the country. It just got written up in the New York Times, and it is very, very funny. Definitely go check out Sarah Schaefer when she comes to a town near you. I'm Luke Burbank right over there, Elena Passarella. We have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We will be back with some incredible music from the band Dead that you do not want to miss. So stay with us. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get to our musical guest this week, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be kicking off February with our Black History Month special. We're going to hear from Jelani Memory. Jelani Memory wanted to talk to his kids about racism, and so he went to try to find an age-appropriate book on the topic, and he couldn't find one. So he wrote his own, and now he's released a whole line of books about serious topics for young people. Uh, we're going to also hear from comedian and former SNL writer. You might remember the uh, Black Jeopardy sketches on SNL that were so great. Sam J was a big part of those. Now Sam has a late-night show on HBO called Pause with Sam J. Then we're gonna have music from actually two different guests. Layla McCalla, who uh, rose to fame during her years as the uh, cellist for the Grammy Award-winning uh, African-American string band, the Carolina Chocolate Drops. And then we're also going to hear some music from the musical duo Black Violin. They'll talk about defining their own sound, which takes inspiration from both classical music and hip hop. So that is all coming up on next week's show. In the meantime, our musical guest this week started out in Chicago, they're inspired by the likes of the Cocteau Twins, James Brown, and Dolly Parton. Their music has been streamed tens of millions of times, and they are about to launch out on a European tour. Before that, though, they're stopping by Livewire to play some music and chat. Their most recent album is Blue Skies, and it's available now. Take a listen to this. It's Dead, here on Livewire. Emily and Jason from Dead, welcome to Livewire. 
What's up? Hi, Luke. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for doing this. Um, there is a really great uh, track off of the album Blue Skies, uh, your latest album. It's called Bad Love, um, which coincides with something on your website that I noticed, which is the Bad Love Hotline. Can you kind of explain how all of that sort of works together? Yeah, basically, we've had this phone number for a couple of years and um, used to just send like weird messages uh, out to whoever would call. But then we, when we put this new record out, we thought it would be fun to entertain uh, people's terrible dating love stories that they could call in and leave a message. <laughs> and those messages are like listed on the website. I was listening to some of them. Yeah, I guess so people like call in with like in the beginning of the campaign, it was like call in with your bad love stories because um, everybody has terrible dating stories. I'm assuming. Um, I know I do. And um, we thought it would be a fun way to, you know, bring levity into uh, the lonely part of dating. <laughs> and yeah, and I guess some of them are on the website, but people still call in and I don't know um, what they're saying now. You know, every now and then we get a notification that there's I think another... we've maybe kind of fixed everyone's problems. Everyone's oh, yeah. really yeah. good. They're just calling to thank us. We noticed that yeah. there good were job. no more bad dates happening anywhere nope. in the world. I guess that was... We're putting <laughs> Tinder out of business. That was us. <laughs> uh, you're listening to Livewire Radio. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarella. We're talking to uh, Jason and Emily from the band Dead. Speaking of... Um, I guess sort of how your songs get created. My daughter, Addie, is a huge fan of yours, has been to a lot of shows. I told her that we were going to get to talk to you, and uh, she said this in text to me. She was like, I think it's really admirable how much they've committed to their own sound and just kind of seem to make art for themselves. And if other people are into it, so be it, but they don't have any pretentiousness. Is that, I mean, kind of what you're trying to do is just make the music that you like? What up, Addy? <laughs> yeah, Addy. <laughs> Addy <laughs> feel seen. Wow, what a badass. What a compliment. Yeah, we are definitely... <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we're trying, because that would be like canceling it out, but we definitely are right. just uh, simply vibing with ourselves. Like, we're friends, we make music, we like it. Uh, what we make happens to have a sound that people recognize, and we kind of stick to it. I guess what I'm wondering about uh, having, I was looking at Spotify and I was noticing that you have songs that are streamed like 7 million times. And then there are other songs that are streamed hundreds of thousands of times, which is still a lot of times. But is it hard to not look at that and then start writing in the direction of the things that are getting 7 million streams? Mm, I think it's no. just mostly more about like what's <laughs> exciting to us, you know? Yeah. And sometimes I guess you could see the numbers and, I guess, like, have that thought for a second, but it's pretty easy to let it go because we're just trying to chase, like, what's interesting mm -hmm. and feels relevant to us at the moment, so... Because that seems to work out well, and, like, mm. when you look at a song that has 7 million views, you're not looking at the whole picture. It's like, well, it's relative to, like, you know, the industry, the time that it came out, what people right. are into, like, what trends are happening, algorithms, money, like, mm -hmm. there's so much that goes into it. Like, it's it would be suicidal to be like mm. i'm gonna put my self-worth into like mm -hmm. views or mm -hmm. streams or follows or even sales it's like yeah it's easier to just stick with what we like and then just kind of roll with it obviously we know like okay well that song did well like mm. you know noted but i don't think <laughs> we make ourselves sick trying to reproduce something that other people saw as a hit you know I was wondering, um, Emily, I was looking at the official dead TikTok feed, which has literally two posts, and it's just you at a gym uh, oh doing, like, crunches, <laughs> um, get, trying to get people to call the bad love hotline. But I noticed that, that the I don't know if you still, but at that time you, you had braces. And I was wondering, does that affect how you sing? Does that change, yeah. like, actually the practice of singing for you? That's so funny. Speaking of the TikTok, I didn't even know it was still there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have the braces? I can't tell from here. No, no, no. I have a, um, the braces are off. I have a gold tooth now. The braces okay. did affect my singing, and you can hear it on some of the songs on this album because I had just gotten them when we were recording, and mm. I have a slight lisp, which I thought was cool. <laughs> I um, love it. And I leaned into it. <laughs> yeah. Does the gold tooth impact how it feels to sing, or is that no. just for a good look? It was an accident. Like the dentist, it was supposed to, it was supposed to be a you know a tooth colored tooth, and it came <laughs> in. And he goes, "I'm so sorry, it's gold." And I was like, "Screw it, <laughs> just put it in. It's gonna look at me." <laughs> like, I, this is destiny. And he was like so excited and brought all his assistants in and he took a <laughs> selfie with me. He was like, "This is amazing." He was like really stoked that I was like into a gold tooth because it's in oh, the front of my it. mouth. He was like, <laughs> "Nobody great. ever does this." I'm like, "Well." I'm not everybody. 
Um, well, what song are we going to hear? We're going to hear love. Bad Love. Yeah, the classic. Hey, oh. playing hey. the hits. Fan favorite. Yeah. Uh, well, we're excited to hear it. This is Dead on Livewire. I was a bad love. Now I can get so. Dead Woo! right here on Livewire. Um, that was great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. That was Dead right here on Livewire. Their latest album, Blue Skies, is out now, and they will be touring Europe. If you're over there, check them out when they come to your town. That is going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. A huge thanks to our guests, Kenji Lopez Alt, Sarah Schaefer, and Dead. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sepchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing manager is Paige Thomas. And our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, Mitch Shepard, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer, and our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff this week. We'd like to thank member Chris Bright of Portland, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can catch our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. <laughs>